Hi guys, this is a physio review for Gas Exchange lectures 20 through 29. We're a bit behind schedule in terms of making these reviews, but I was off uh, my sister's baby shower, so uh, totally worth it. Um, but for these reviews, uh, we do have a decent amount of material. That said, I think that for this particular set of lectures, really the emphasis should just be on using your intuition. Uh, gas exchange is you know, fairly straightforward. Uh, nature of a vacuum, things will go from high pressure to low pressure. Um, we're familiar with startling forces, for instance. So uh, none of this stuff is particularly uh, challenging. It's just presented in a weird way, like usual. So uh, we'll do our best, and uh, we'll start with talking about blood flow, um, and then we'll get into gas exchange itself. But the idea is that we have the coupling of um, partial pressures and then blood flow to get the transport of um, oxygen to the rest of the body, and then carbon dioxide as our waste expelled from the uh, lungs. All right, so uh, starting with uh, pulmonary and uh, bronchial circulation, uh, the first part of these lectures is making a point about uh, pulmonary versus uh, systematic circulation. And so uh, really here we have systematic circulation. We can see the rest of the heart, or rest of the body, the kidneys, liver. Uh, this is supposed to be like the limbs. We're focused right now on um, right ventricle to lungs, back to uh, left atrium, right or left ventricle, and then um, really pulmonary circulation here. And so uh, the first basic premise is that here we have a comparison of systematic versus pulmonary uh, circulation. Uh, you can see here that, you know, we have our nice systematic blood pressure numbers that we're familiar with, 120 over 80 would be a you know, nice healthy number, normal number. Pulmonary blood pressure, we see 25 over 8. So you can already tell that the first big difference between pulmonary and systematic circulation is a much lower uh, blood pressure uh, generally. Uh, along with this, you have a lower uh, resistance to the flow of blood and you have a higher compliance uh, generally in this pulmonary circulation. So um, this gives us these three factors really start to give us some of the functions of pulmonary blood flow. Uh, first is, you know, of course we know this is dealing with respiratory gas exchange. We want to get rid of carbon dioxide because it's a waste product from, um, you know, metabolism of fuels in our, our cells, um, you know, glycolysis, citric acid cycle, etc. Um, so gas exchange, getting oxygen, carbon dioxide out. But then we also have a couple of other functions uh, such as blood filtration. So we just have basically so many different capillaries inside of the lungs um, that are perfusing the alveoli that they can act as a blood filter. So you can have clots that go into these capillary beds, blocks off capillary bed. Um, and, you know, this is not as traumatic as in, say, getting a clot in the brain or, you know, we're familiar with clots in the rest of the body where um, basically blood has to get redirected around it. The lungs have so many capillaries that to get a clot, um, you know, you just use other capillary beds. And uh, then the clots can start to get broken down. I'm saying clots, but this could work for you know, other fine particles. Um, and we have a lot of robust set of enzymatic processes to break down these clots, uh, or macrophages can eat those particles, um, or these filtrates can go into our lymphatic system. So blood filtration is sort of a secondary function of pulmonary blood flow. Uh, this one's a big one, acting as a blood reservoir. So we say that the lungs are kind of a secondary heart. And so the idea is this like relatively higher compliance that the pulmonary circulatory system has in, compared to, in, comparison, in comparison to the systematic uh, circulatory system. Um, this higher compliance means that, and coupled with the fact that there's just so many capillaries, um, because there's so many different alveoli, the lungs are capable of storing an enormous amount of blood. And so just through the act of breathing in and out, right, your lungs are expanding and contracting. And so you can, you know, push on this, this blood. Um, and so vasoconstricting or decreasing lung size when you are uh, breathing out, this can return blood to the heart and therefore our lung is called an accessory heart. So blood reservoirs are secondary function. And then another function is metabolizing um, substances that are circulating through the blood. Um, and so our nice endothelial cells that are lining our uh, vasculature or blood vessels in the lungs will either uptake or release different metabolic substances. And so here's just a few of them, but we have our pro-inflammatories, our pro prostaglandins, our leukotrienes, and we have our, uh, which will remove these guys, um, that will remove uh, serotonin, uh, neuroepinephrine, uh, it will inactivate acetylcholine, right, neurotransmitters, uh, inactivate uh, bradykinin, which is a vasodilator. Uh, it will uh, convert angiotensin to angiotensin 2, which we're very familiar with, and then synthesize a pro-inflammatory uh, platelet activating factor, and then uh, synthesize our friend nitric oxide, which we know is our vasodilator. All right, so uh, basically, our pulmonary circulatory system, lower mean arterial pressure, lower resistance, higher compliance, acts as a blood filter, acts as an accessory heart, aka blood reservoir, and can uh, break down and activate pro-inflammatories, um, and then make some uh, nitric oxide. All right, so uh, that said, the blood flow within the lungs itself, there's really two circulatory uh, circulations of blood in the, the lungs. There's the one that we've been talking about, which is the pulmonary blood flow, which, you know, the main purpose is for gas exchange, so it's pulmonary circulation, which is shown here with the pulmonary vein going to the AVOI. Right, we're going from um, pulmonary vein, which is uh, actually going back to the uh, left atrium, but our blood is coming from our pulmonary artery, passed into the capillaries, past our alveoli, and then eventually into our pulmonary veins. So our pulmonary circulatory system for gas exchange, then we have our bronchial arteries, which are just supplying nutrients to uh, the conducting zone. And so uh, these bronchial arteries are coming from branches of the aorta. And then importantly, because we're going to be talking about uh, shunts in a little bit, uh, our drainage of this, our bronchial veins, one third of it will drain into the zygos, hemizygos, and intercostal veins, which we're familiar with from anatomy. Uh, but then two thirds will drain into the pulmonary veins. We know that the pulmonary veins are high oxygen content because the pulmonary veins are going to the left atrium. Uh, so this is going to be a mixing of oxygen poor blood with oxygen rich blood in the first example of uh, shunt that we have in the body. All right. So then, uh, you know, if we're talking about pulmonary blood flow, and, you know, again, the objective is to focus on gas exchange, we know we need those red blood cells to go past the alveoli. Uh, what exactly is regulating pulmonary blood flow? Uh, and so we have a number of different factors, but just very quickly, we have alveolar hypoxia. Uh, so if we are not getting enough blood or oxygen to alveoli, you'll have constriction of adjacent blood vessels. Uh, innervation by the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems. Then we have uh, circulating factors, our vasoconstrictors, vasodilators. Then we have the concept of recruitment and distension. We have uh, lung volumes itself compressing, expanding lungs compress capillaries, and then uh, the force of gravity uh, has a greater effect on blood flow than on 
uh, gas, right? Gravity um, acts on all mass, and denser subjects are going to have a greater uh, sort of net pull per volume than a denser, uh, less dense substance. All right, and so uh, just taking a quicker, you know, more in-depth look at this, um, factors influencing blood flow, alveolar hypoxia. So basically, if we have, you know, less oxygen to an alveoli, um, we're going to have constriction of the blood vessel that serves us so that we can redirect blood flow to alveoli that have higher oxygen content in them to maintain efficiency, right? And so um, just exactly that, if we don't have enough oxygen in our alveoli, constrict the adjacent blood vessels to redirect blood flow where it really needs to go. All right, and then there's a general note, uh, general lack of oxygen hypoxic environment in the womb keeps um, pulmonary vasoconstrictive active. And so this mechanism is generally seen as a good thing for uh, when you're in the womb, but also for you know, maintaining efficiency of oxygen uh, diffusion. All right, uh, second one is innervation. So the parasympathetic nervous system is going to do vasodilation. The sympathetic nervous system is going to do vasoconstriction. And I found this a little bit confusing, um, but uh, generally the idea is that you know, focus on dilation of the airways instead of vasoconstriction for thinking about rest and digest or fight or flight. Uh, the sympathetic nervous system is fight or flight and bronchodilation right, is bringing more air into the lungs. Um, and so that would be supportive of fight or flight. But the sympathetic nervous system is doing vasoconstriction in the lungs. Um, and specifically the pulmonary arteries are more affected than the pulmonary veins. All right, and so pulmonary arteries are bringing in oxygen uh, poor blood um, and pulmonary veins are taking away oxygen rich blood. So maybe our answer is uh, in there. Okay, so then we have our circulating factors, uh, our vasoconstrictors, our kaeocholamines, norepinephrine, epinephrine, angiotensin 2, which we know is constricting those angiotensins, those angios, or blood vessels, uh, histamine, a pro inflammatory, uh, prostaglandin uh, 2, again, pro inflammatory, uh, therefore vasoconstrictor, endothelium, which is our, our traditional vasoconstrictor from our endothelial cells. Um, and then we have our vasodilators, uh, PGE2, uh, PGI2, both their pro. Uh, Stiglatins, and then endothelium-derived relaxing factor, EDRF, we have been exposed to that before, and then our friend nitric oxide or vasodilators. All right, so then going on to this concept, uh, we have a concept of recruitment and distension. Uh, so basically the idea is that uh, recruitment is, as you have more blood flow to the lung or the left atrial pressure increases, um, recruitment and distension are going to cause the pulmonary vascular resistance to decrease. All right, and so this leads to uh, this decrease in pulmonary vascular resistance will allow an increase in pulmonary arterial resistance, arterial pressure. Um, and so basically what, saying, what we're trying to say is that if blood flow increases to the lung or left atrial pressure increases, then you're going to have uh, recruitment of uh, vessels. So these are alveoli around more and more vessels, right? If this pressure increases, then it's going to open up more and more of these capillaries. Um, and likewise, as pressure increases or blood flow to the uh, lungs increases, the uh, vessels around the alveoli are going to distend um, and become even larger. And so the net result is that you have more and more, you have a decrease in resistance overall. Um, and so decrease in resistance, we know, means you know, we're further feeding into an increase in, in blood flow, which caused this to begin with. Uh, there's a downside to this. If there's too much increase in blood flow or the uh, too much increase in left arterial pressure, this can result in capillary damage, right? These capillaries are descending as you have an increase in blood flow, increase in pressure. Um, this can cause leakage from the capillaries and leakage into the alveoli, uh, causing pulmonary edema, which we'll talk about in a little bit. All right, so uh, recruitment and distension will lower uh, pulmonary vascular resistance, increasing pulmonary blood flow. And it's kind of a self-cyclic feeding thing in the sense that that blood flow um, is allowing for recruitment and extension, which allows for more blood flow. All right, so then we have our lung volumes. And specifically, we're going to be talking about um, the effect of the lung volume inside, expanding lung volume inside of the lung. Um, so expanding, increasing lung volume compresses alveolar and pulmonary capillaries uh, inside of the lung. So arterial resistance increases during inspiration. And so the idea is that as these guys expand, you do have some compression on the vessels around the alveoli. Um, however, the vessels that are exposed to the inner pleural cavity, so that would be right here, extra alveolar blood vessels, um, are going to decrease, decrease in resistance during inhalation. All right, so the vessels that are inside the lungs around the alveoli are going to increase in resistance as the alveoli press on them, but the vessels that are exposed to the thoracic cavity, the interpleural pressure, are going to uh, decrease in resistance. They're going to expand during inhalation. So like, why does this make sense? Well, uh, when you're breathing in, the volume in the thoracic cage increases, and so uh, the pressure that is outside of these vessels is dropping, right? And so nature pours a vacuum, and so our vessels are going to expand because the pressure outside of them in the interpleural cavity is decreasing during inhalation, right? Um, and so as a result, the pressure, the vessels become bigger, resistance in the blood vessels outside the lungs uh, exposes the interpleural cavity is going to decrease, and blood can flow easier. All right, and so that's what this chart is trying to say. Uh, as you're breathing in, basically the pressure in the blood vessels adjacent to your alveoli is going to see an increase in resistance, and then the vessels that are um, exposed to the interpleural cavity, aka the extra alveolar blood pressures, are going to have a decrease in resistance as a result of this interpleural pressure becoming um, uh, more vacuum-like, right, as the volume in the thoracic cage increases. All right, so then, so that's lung volume. Our final one for influencing pulmonary blood flow is the force of gravity. And so we touched on this before, right? We said that, you know, you flap your arms around, we're at the bottom of an ocean of gas. If you go to the top of Mount Everest, there's, you know, less density of air molecules, right? And so uh, we haven't really talked about that in relation to blood, though. But just, you know, imagine in your mind that, um, Right, you're standing at the bottom of an ocean of gas, and you're like, I'm not getting crushed, but you go to the bottom of an ocean of water, and you get crushed, right? And so the influence of gravity on blood flow is going to be more significant um, for perfusion, aka blood flow, than it is for um, air, right? Because blood, being primarily water, is denser than air. All right, and so um, basically the premise is uh, arterial capillaries uh, and veins are going to experience a pressure increase the further down you go due to gravity within the lungs. Um, and so we have zones one through four. 
basically the idea is that uh, zone one is at the top, zone four is at the bottom. And in zone four, the pressure in the arteries and veins uh, as a result of gravity are greater than the air pressure in the AVOA, right? So this is the pressure in the AVOA, relatively constant, doesn't change quite as much as a result of gravity due to right, the fact air is dense. Um, and so here we're treating it as you know, constant in these diagrams, which is a little bit cool, but you know, it's okay, we'll accept it for trying to illustrate the idea that blood pressure changes more due to gravity than air pressure. Um, and so within a healthy lung, you have zones uh, two, three, and four. Uh, but the idea is you can see that the alveolar pressure um, is going to, as you get closer to the top of the lung, um, it is going to relatively stay constant, uh, but the pressure of the vessels is going to uh, decrease. All right? And so uh, you can see that here. Here we have uh, plus 20 as we go from, this is zone three, and then we have plus seven, plus three, and then we have zero. Um, and you can see that as we go from a higher capillary arterial pressure to a lower capillary arterial pressure, that the uh, relative decrease of the capillary arterial pressure to the relatively constant pressure of the alveoli is going to result in, as you get further up, the resistance in these capillaries is going to increase as the um, pressure difference is going to cause a pinching of the capillaries as you go from zone four, from the bottom of the lungs, uh, up to the top, which is zone two. All right, specifically zone one um, doesn't occur in healthy lungs or like a normal lung. Um, so typically, you know, at the top, very top of the lung for a healthy person, you'd see zone two, which is where the alveolar pressure is greater than the um, venous pressure, and you would see compression of these uh, capillaries um, and veins or specifically the veins would be compressed. All right, so factors that regulate pulmonary blood flow, alveolar hypoxia, vasoconstriction, uh, innervation, circulating vasoconstrictors, dilators, recruitment, distension due to blood flow, aka decreasing resistance as you have more blood flow. Um, then we have lung volumes inside the lungs expanding alveolar. Alveoli can crush capillaries, um, increasing resistance, but if you're in the vessel exposed to the inner cavity as you inhale, um, you're going to actually decrease in resistance due to expansion. And then the force of gravity we know is more impactful on blood than it is on uh, gases. And so as a result, as you go from the bottom of the lungs to the top, you will see that the uh, alveolar pressure is relatively constant in comparison to the capillary and venous pressure. And so you will get your, as you go further up, your capillaries and veins start to get pinched um, by the pressure from the AVOI. All right. So my goodness, that was a lot. Uh, let's just move on. Uh, all right. So now we're dealing with partial pressures. And again, the purpose is to talk about gas exchange. And so, right, we said that things like to go from high pressure to low pressure. So what we're trying to set up is a pressure in the alveoli versus a pressure in the pulmonary capillaries um, to drive diffusion from the alveoli to the capillaries and then later on from the capillaries into uh, tissue through you know, the rest of the body. And so um, to start off with, we need to understand the partial pressures of oxygen and carbon dioxide generally. And so how do we actually get a partial pressure, like a general partial pressure of oxygen and carbon dioxide in atmosphere? So that, that is a great question. And the first part is understanding that it's really dependent on a couple of different things. The first is partial pressure of oxygen and carbon dioxide depends on the atmospheric pressure itself, right? We know that based on the fact that you are breathing fine here, you go to the top of Mount Everest and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't breathe because the partial pressure of oxygen is much lower. Why is it so much lower? Because the partial the overall pressure is much lower um, at the top of Mount Everest, right? So uh, atmospheric pressure, aka barometric pressure, depends on altitude, which we're very familiar with here. All right, uh, then it also depends on partial pressure of oxygen, also depends on the concentration of oxygen, the percent concentration of oxygen of the total mixture. And so these numbers are gonna be constant. Uh, whether or not you're here on top of Mount Everest or you're here in Michigan. Uh, and so our percent concentration of oxygen is 20.93%. Carbon dioxide is 0.03%. And then we don't need to know this one, but uh, it's good to know that most of the air is, in fact, nitrogen gas at 79.04%. All right, the third factor is uh, water vapor pressure. And this depends on temperature, but we know a nice factoid, which is the human body is very consistent at a um, 37 degrees Celsius. Uh, and so as you inhale, air is warmed and saturated with water. And so we know at a baseline that of the total composition of the uh, gas that comes into our lungs, this vapor pressure is going to make up a set 47 millimeters of mercury, all right? And so that gives us uh, a loose calculation to get the partial pressure of oxygen and carbon dioxide that are coming into our body, all right? So it's not uh, like perfect, but uh, it can give us some approximations and give us this table right here. But basically you have the partial pressure of oxygen is the percent concentration of oxygen, which is always gonna be our 20%, uh, times the pressure of the atmosphere, which changes based on altitude, minus the water vapor pressure, all right? And then for us, this is gonna be constant at 47 millimeters of mercury. Why? Because the human body is a set temperature, all right? You can do the same thing for carbon dioxide, um, but for oxygen, it comes out to this equation. And then if you plug in your atmospheric pressures based on your altitude, right, that will change. Here it's labeled PB for P barometric, but it's the same thing, P atmospheric, P barometric. Um, and you go ahead and you calculate, and here's our percentage as a uh, fraction. All right, so um, presuming we are at uh, sea level, altitude zero, uh, 159.2, 160, uh, is our partial pressure of oxygen. And then, um, you know, what is the point of this? Well, you know, our partial pressure of, basically when we have our blood going from our right heart past the alveoli, we wanna have the partial pressure of oxygen to be greater in the alveoli than it is in the uh, pulmonary um, arteries, right? So that oxygen goes in, and we can see that that's the case. Here, the partial pressure of oxygen is 105. Here, the partial pressure is 40. And so there's a greater concentration, greater partial pressure here. So there's gonna be a diffusion of gas into the pulmonary uh, arteries, capillaries. All right, and then likewise, the same is true in reverse. For carbon dioxide, we can see that in the pulmonary arteries, um, aka capillaries, the carbon dioxide partial pressure is higher than inside of the alveoli, and so there's a net uh, diffusion out into the alveoli of carbon dioxide. All right, and then the same is the opposite, is what we're looking for in the tissues, right? We want um, oxygen to leave, and so our partial pressure in the blood is greater than in the tissue for oxygen, so uh, there's a net diffusion out of the blood of oxygen, and then the net diffusion in of our carbon dioxide, as we see, greater than 46 millimeters mercury versus our 40 millimeters mercury of carbon dioxide. All right, so this is all stuff that you should know. I mean, I wouldn't be stressed about this. Um, this lecture is just presenting all the stuff that we already know in kind of a weird way. All right, so then uh, what about during breathing? How do we have, like, what are changes of O2 and CO2 during breathing and breathing in and breathing out? 
Uh, this again is, is pretty straightforward. Um, we have our, uh, you know, slightly lower. So here's our partial pressure of oxygen and carbon dioxide uh, due to atmosphere, right? We calculated that. Um, these are approximate numbers, presumably slightly different due to your elevation. Um, and then we have our current partial pressures as a result of our biological processes, right? We've used a certain amount of carbon dioxide, we've produced a certain amount of carbon dioxide, we've taken in a certain amount of oxygen. So after we bring in the uh, partial pressure from the atmosphere, uh, we have mixing, and you can see that the partial pressure inside of the lungs for oxygen has increased, and for carbon dioxide it has decreased. Um, and then we go ahead and we breathe out, and we, um, you know, during the breathe out, our partial pressure stay mostly the same, but we go from uh, these higher values back to these sort of baseline values before breathing in um, as we have gas exchange from the blood um, into the uh, AVOI. All right, so basically breathing in, our partial pressure of oxygen is going to increase due to mixing, and our partial pressure of carbon dioxide is going to decrease due to mixing of the atmospheric air in the lungs, right? So use your intuition, right? What's the purpose of this gas exchange to get rid of carbon dioxide to increase our oxygen uh, partial pressure? All right, so then uh, going to the topic of diffusion of gas across our AVOI into the capillaries, you know, what actually affects this? Well, you know, go back to what you know about uh, cell membranes, right? We have uh, solubility, and we said, uh, you know, light dissolves likes, polar and nonpolar. Nonpolar substances make it past cell membranes pretty easily. You know, tiny molecules make it past a cell membrane even if they're charged pretty easily, but if they're big, they won't. Um, and so, you know, same sort of things apply. Gas solubility um, will affect the, how easily it gets through the uh, membrane in the capillary. Molecular weight, uh, thickness and area of this barrier. Then the pressure difference, right? A bigger pressure differential. If there's a higher pressure on the outside versus the inside, um, there's going to be, you know, a greater uh, change in entropy, bigger drive to uh, have diffusion. Then we have uh, pulmonary uh, blood flow velocity, right? And so the idea is that uh, if you're having your red blood cells, um, they're going to be taking up the, the gas, right? And so if you have more red blood cells going by and they're taking the oxygen, um, then you're just going to continuously drive diffusion, right? But importantly, good thing to know, it takes about a quarter of a second for a red blood cell to get its oxygen from the alveoli, um, and they generally take about three quarters of a second as they pass through the capillary. Um, but for athletes, sometimes you see uh, too fast of blood flow and they can get hypooxemia, uh, aka not enough oxygen um, as a result of blood flowing too fast, All right? And so here's our diagram from lecture. This is just saying things that you know. Uh, the rate of diffusion right here is dependent on the area and thickness of the membrane, and it's dependent on the qualities of the gas, such as the solubility of the gas. Is it nonpolar? Is it small? Um, and then molecular weight, is it small? Is it large? And then the difference in pressure, greater differential, is going to drive uh, diffusion, a faster rate of diffusion. Okay, and then we have the idea that carbon dioxide diffuses about 20 times faster than oxygen, but we also know that there is a um, generally a smaller uh, pressure differential between oxygen or between carbon dioxide than there is for uh, between oxygen across these membranes. All right, so then diseases impacting diffusion, we're fairly familiar with these. We've learned about restrictive and obstructive uh, lung diseases. Um, one of our famous COPD diseases, emphysema, uh, is destruction of you know, the walls between alveoli. So we have less surface area for gas exchange, therefore diffusions can go down in emphysema. Uh, fibrotic lung disease, our example of our too much connective tissue, aka fibrosis, our um, fibroblasts are going crazy, maybe stimulated by the immune system, um, and some sort of autoimmune disease. We have a thicker membrane that slows diffusion in fibrosis, and so you have a decrease in diffusion overall. And then pulmonary edema, we have uh, fluid in the interstitial space or fluid in the avular sac. Um, it increases the diffusion distance and therefore decreases uh, diffusion overall. All right, so then that brings us to the concept of uh, pulmonary edema. And pulmonary edema is generally caused by pulmonary hypertension, uh, which we started to mention earlier. We said that uh, downside to recruitment extension is if there's too much uh, blood pressure, too much uh, blood flow, you can have leakage from the capillaries into the interstitial fluid, uh, interstitial space, uh, or into the avular sacs and cause edema. Um, and so pulmonary hypertension tension can cause edema. That itself is caused by uh, an increase in vascular resistance, pulmonary vascular resistance. So we have this equation, uh, pulmonary arterial pressure is equal to pulmonary vascular resistance times cardiac output. Um, and so the idea is that, uh, you know, what can increase pulmonary vascular resistance? Uh, wall thickening, fibrosis, inflammation, extra mucus. Um, and then uh, generally, so pulmonary vascular resistance is leading to hypertension. Uh, pulmonary hypertension is greatly increased as a result of sustained vasoconstriction wall thickening um, in sort of some pathologic process. Uh, wall thickening is maintained generally uh, through apoptosis and cell proliferation. Uh, we do have a breakdown of the different groups of pulmonary hypertension that was given to us in lecture. And so you have group one right here, um, which is like inherited or drogotoxin induced, uh, connected, caused by connective tissue disease, HIV, uh, not as serious. Um, and then group two, you have pulmonary hypertension due to left heart disease. Um, so you know, restriction here, such that the blood can't get into left atrium um, or pore pumping here, um, something wrong with the left heart. Uh, then we have group three, uh, pulmonary hypertension due to lung disease or hypox hypoxemia. Um, and then four, chronic um, clots, and then five, um, unclear multifactorial mechanisms. All right, so you probably don't know what, need to know too much about that, but it's good to know um, that, you know, why does pulmonary hypertension cause pulmonary edema? Uh, edema, we're familiar with starling forces. This is just a quick picture of what pulmonary edema can look like, right? Build up a fluid in sacs, and this can result in less gas exchange and gas diffusion. Um, generally, net filtration as a result of starling forces through our uh, pulmonary capillaries is uh, about 20 milliliters per hour um, in humans in the lungs. And then, uh, you know, this pulmonary, this fluid that's going into our uh, pulmonary sacs when we have pulmonary hypertension, or avular sacs when we have pulmonary hypertension, you know, generally that would have drained into our lymphatic system uh, overall. But we're familiar with starling forces, so there's not too much to go over here, just, you know, what is causing filtration of fluid into or out of the capillaries, uh, the pressure in the capillaries itself, the oncotic pressure, uh, right, the concentration of uh, proteins, um, stuff inside of the, uh, you know, 
vessel such that you know you want to have um, equilibrium and equilibrium is going to drive diffusion or diffusion is attempting to reach equilibrium and so you have uh, these we're familiar with this uh, there's this extra term here which i think is normally absorbed into k but it's the uh, sigma the effectiveness of the capillary wall by preventing protein crossing aka radiation all right so then uh, what other factors impact the partial pressure of oxygen and carbon dioxide well you're probably familiar with these um, but hyperventilation right just breathing too much hypoventilation not breathing enough uh shunts we started to talk about as we said the bronchial um, circulation feeding the conducting zone of the lungs will drain into the pulmonary vein. So that's a good example of shunt, but mixing of oxygen poor blood with oxygen rich blood. Uh, then we also have uh, ventilation perfusion mismatch. So the rate which you breathe in versus you know the blood flow past the uh, alveoli needs to be well matched. Otherwise, uh, you're not going to have uh, appropriate uh, partial pressures of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So let's just start by looking at hyperventilation, hypoventilation. This is where we start in the lecture. But the basic premise is that you know if you're hyperventilating, you're breathing too much, and if you breathe too much, you're going to increase the amount of O2 in your blood, and the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is going to uh, go down. Why you just have you know increased gas exchange um, and you have a lot of gas exchange, it's just overall, um, you're getting the carbon dioxide out faster than the oxygen in quicker. Um, then you have hypoventilation, which is not breathing enough, right, holding your breath. And so you have a buildup in carbon dioxide since you have less gas exchange, and you have a decrease in oxygen in your blood as it's being used up. And so that said, uh, one of the things that happens when you hypoventilate is, you know, we're, we're familiar with um, the, we're familiar with this equation over here, um, which is carbon dioxide, um, will be catalyzed by carbonic anhydrase to uh, carbonic acid, which um, will further break down to uh, bicarbonate ion and um, hydrogen ions. And so basically what happens is if you have more and more carbon dioxide in your blood, well, it's going to shift this equation to the right and you're going to end up with more hydrogen ions and your pH is going to decrease. You're going to become more acidic, right? And so um, basically the if you're hypoventilating, not breathing enough, your pH is going to go down, you become more acidic. If you're hyperventilating, your pH is going to go up. And you know this tells us another important factor, function of the lungs, which is you know, maintaining blood pH. And why is this important? Well, the body always wants to maintain homeostasis, uh, maintain pH with a certain range. But specifically, remember, proteins and enzymes have a certain pH range at which they are useful. All right. And so um, hypoventilating, increase in carbon dioxide, increase in hydrogen ions, decrease in pH, you are now too acidic. Um, and that is bad. And so we have this relationship called the uh, Cassirier lake equation, uh, which just says the partial pressure of carbon dioxide and the concentration of hydrogen ions in the blood are directly related. Um, and you can use this to you know, try to calculate uh, pH overall. All right, so then uh, we were given a couple of examples of pH control uh, because this is you know, an important function of the lungs. Uh, lungs are kind of the short-term pH control, like rapid acting. Um, and so, but they don't work alone. Uh, they work with the kidneys in particular. And so we were given a case of acidosis and um, alkalosis. Acidosis where our pH is uh, too low and alkalosis where our pH is too high. Uh, and so if we are hypoventilating, a decrease in hypoventilation relative to the metabolic production of carbon dioxide leads to the accumulation of carbon dioxide and respiratory acidosis, right? That's this equation right here. Um, the kidneys are going to buffer this carbon dioxide by adding bicarbonate ion to shift this equation um, back this way, get rid of the uh, concentration of the uh, hydrogen ions. Um, and so the kidneys will uh, put bicarbonate into your system. Um, and then the hope is that you're going to start breathing more um, overall, okay? Uh, but different metabolic disturbances can also cause this acidosis, right? Our important one that we're familiar with is uh, diabetes. And so our diabetics who have acidosis, they can uh, try to, basically you'll see them uh, you know, breathe more to try to get rid of that excess uh, acid as this equation gets shifted to the right or to the left. All right, and then the opposite case, if you're breathing too much, uh, you have a uh, reduction of carbon dioxide um, and a relative alkalosis, right? You have a big decrease in this guy, which means your pH is gonna go up. And uh, as a result, you are going to try and drive the equation to the right by having your kidneys remove this. Uh, the other method that you can do is um, try to <laughs> slow down your breathing. Um, but you also have our metabolic processes that can result in the alkalosis. Um, so we have um, adding alkali ingestion, basically eating bases or uh, vomiting, uh, gastric suction, diuretics, uh, losing acids. All right, so um, that is that on hyperventilation. Uh, we are going to talk tiny bit about shunts and we're almost done, but the factors that are, again, affecting partial pressure of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Uh, we talked about bronchial circulation, this idea that um, in our lungs we have pulmonary circulation, but then we also have um, bronchial circulation coming from our aorta, and that's giving nutrients and oxygen to the conducting region of our lungs. But specifically, this doesn't drain into the superior or inferior vena cava. Uh, it drains into the uh, either the exogenous vein or importantly the pulmonary vein here which is o2 rich right and so this o2 poor and o2 rich uh, are going to mix and as a result of the mixing you're going to affect the partial pressure of oxygen and carbon dioxide of this um blood all right and so that's one example of a shunt the second one is our thespian circulation and so the idea is that in the left ventricle the blood that's perfusing the left ventricle myocytes uh, actually drain into the left ventricle itself all right so we can see that here these are the thespian veins uh, we have our uh, coronary arteries which are feeding our left ventricle and then uh, we have these thespian veins which are just draining directly into the uh, cavity of the chamber of the left ventricle all right, so mixing oxygen poor with oxygen rich blood. All right, um, and then the third, you know, case of a shunt would be an in, in, unintentional shunt, which would be holes in our alveolar alveoli uh, that aren't supposed to be there, or uh, septal defects between our atriums and our uh, ventricles. Okay, so uh, shunts can affect partial pressure of oxygen carbon dioxide, and then we have the concept of ventilation and perfusion matching. Um, so the idea is that we have air coming into our alveoli, and that 
oxygen and carbon dioxide are going to be exchanged with the blood. But what if the, like we talked about with athletes, what if the rate of blood flow uh, is not appropriate for the oxygen amount that is inside of the alveoli itself? Then you would have uh, ventilation perfusion mismatch. Um, and generally, you know, they're well matched and this is an issue, but you can sometimes have uh, ventilation perfusion not match up perfectly. And so we have an equation, we have a ratio, uh, ventilation over perfusion, perfusion is Q, blood flow. Um, this ratio is going to change our partial pressure of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the blood, right? We need, the idea is that in the normal situation, the oxygen here is going to go in blood, the carbon dioxide here is going to go into the AVOI, but what if you have an obstruction? Uh, your perfusion is normal in your veins, but your uh, oxygen is not getting in, so your partial pressure of oxygen is decreasing, your carbon dioxide is skyrocketing, so you're still having carbon dioxide being fed into it, uh, but you have a mismatch here, and so uh, your net result is your partial pressure of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the vessels is off, and then you can have uh, poor, uh, poor perfusion, where you have an embolus or blockage in a vessel where and your ventilation is perfectly fine, all right? And so, uh, unfortunately, this goes back to the concept of, of gravity and height, and specifically, right, going back to this concept that our blood being denser than air is gonna be more affected by uh, gravity um, in terms of pressure than uh, air will be based on the differences in height of the, uh, along the length of the lung. And so, uh, perfusion is blood flow, and uh, you're gonna have Basically, uh, at the base of the lung, you're gonna have the greatest perfusion blood flow, right? Blood's gonna pool to the bottom of the lung, just like blood pools in your feet. Um, and then same thing at the bottom of the lungs. So at this point here, uh, you're gonna have the greatest ventilation, V. But specifically, as you go from the bottom to the top, right? We said the influence of gravity here uh, is a little bit variable. You'll see that the ventilation doesn't have as big of a change as it goes from bottom to top as perfusion does, right? Um, or blood being denser than our, our air. Right? There's just more molecules of liquid being affected by the force of gravity than there are molecules of air. All right, and so, you know, what can we take away from this? Well. Um, our perfusion, our ventilation perfusion, Q over, or V over Q ratio is going to change depending where you are in the lungs. Um, and you'll see that the partial pressure of carbon dioxide and the partial pressure of oxygen will change depending on where you are in the lungs. So um, here at the you know, bottom of the lungs, you can see that our carbon dioxide is higher at the bottom. And at the top of the lungs, our carbon dioxide is relatively low. Whereas here at the bottom of the lungs, the oxygen is relatively low, but at the top of the lungs, the oxygen is uh, relatively high. All right, and so um, <laughs> a little bit more on you know, why that's the case is uh, here, and you can read that yourself, but uh, this might like to move on, it's been like an hour long thing. All right, so um, what if you do have a ventilation perfusion mismatch? match? What if the rate of oxygen coming into your AVOI is not matching the rate at which the blood is flowing past the AVOI to take that oxygen away? What can you do? Um, and so we've given two examples in the lecture. Uh, the first was, you know, what if you have a lung that's obstructed, right? You have an obstruction of the lung. And so we've already kind of touched on this. Uh, the very first slide, we said that AVOI hypoxia will lead to vasoconstriction. constriction. Um, but here, say we have one lung is obstructed, right? You can't get air in. Perfusion is fine, right? We see blood flow is fine. Uh, but ventilation is going way down. Uh, perfusion stayed the same. And as a result, um, basically what happens is the human body is going to naturally increase the ventilation in the second lung. So over here, this lung's ventilation is going to increase. All right, and so the idea is that um, you're gonna try and maintain, you know, the overall um, like net arterial uh, oxygen content and such that, you know, you can still get your body what it needs, right? So uh, ventilation decreases in this lung, it's gonna increase in the other. You're also going to have that alveolar hypoxia effect, which is vasoconstriction of the vessels around the obstructed lung. Um, and so you're gonna shunt the blood to the unobstructed lung and increase the uh, perfusion, the blood flow to this guy over here. And uh, you can see that here, this one's gotten smaller, this guy's gotten bigger. All right, uh, the second example was, you know, what if you have an embolism inside of the uh, artery? The perfusion's gonna decrease, right? There's just less blood flow to this particular lung. And so the net result is you're going to have an increase in perfusion over here, right? So you're gonna have increase in perfusion in lung two. Um, you're also going to have a decrease in uh, ventilation in uh, this, this first lung right here uh, as a result of bronchiolar constriction, uh, diverting the airway, the air to the second lung. So an increase in blood flow here and an increase in uh, ventilation to the lung that's working. All right, and then the secondary thing that's gonna happen in this first lung, um, again, you're using the, uh, the partial pressures of oxygen or you know, signals to cause vasoconstriction, vasodilation, um, to cause these changes to occur. And so uh, the final thing that will happen in the first lung is due to less blood flow, uh, the type two alveolar cells, alveolar cells are gonna make less surfactant and that's gonna cause alveoli to collapse. Um, and that's going to shunt even more airflow to the lung that is functioning correctly. All right, um, so then the final thing is to, you know, what if you do have, um, some kind of shunt and that's not supposed to be there, is it possible to diagnose a, you know, a, a shunt? Um, and the answer is you can use this concept of ventilation, uh, perfusion, blood flow, uh, mismatch to you know, try and find out if there's an inappropriate uh, shunt of blood, say past a you know, collapsed lung. Um, and so the idea is that if you give somebody 100% oxygen, right, connecting to a tank, if there's no shunt um, around the lung, then the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood will just increase, right? You can see here, this is the case of no shunt, the partial pressure of oxygen um, from left and right lung is approximately the same, you give them 100% oxygen, you can see that you know, it's been a, maybe a small increase. But if they do have a shunt, if there is a shunt present, then um, there's gonna be uh, no increase, right? Because you're still, it's not gonna help, the increase in oxygen is gonna help this guy because um, you're having a shunt around this guy and the blood from this guy is still gonna be oxygen poor and mixed with your oxygen rich blood uh, down here. And so adding the oxygen is going to help increase the oxygen content of the blood over here, but it's not gonna do anything for this one. And so you'll still have a high and low value mixed overall here and you're still gonna have a low uh, O2 content if you have a shunt overall, all right? So if there is a shunt, then giving 100% oxygen isn't gonna result in the PO2 going up. If there is, that is, um, 
I get a little bit tired. Uh, if there is a shunt, then PO2 won't increase with oxygen added. All right, so here's the review questions. Take a look at them in your own time. I uploaded them to the Google Drive. Uh, good job, guys. And you know, just a reminder, we have the uh, equations right here. And we'll see you in the next one.